So I don't know where we got to, but I was talking about early spring. And these are some of the things that you can be doing in the early spring. I'm talking about like late February into early March. Um, so taking care of your tools is one thing that you can be doing during this time. Pruning your trees and shrubs, planting your cool season vegetables. I would probably wait more into like middle of March with that, not so much beginning of March, um, but they are ones that you can plant in the cooler time. Um, cutting back perennials and grasses you can start doing, and then weeding is something that you wanna start getting on top of. Um, during this time, snow is kind of starting to melt, like, uh, and then in some places it might be melted and then we have a random storm. So this is the time that you're kind of gonna be playing with the weather a little bit, but it is a good time to be able to start getting started at least on some things. Um, so taking care of your tools is something that you can do with during the winter, but as like, but even like during the springtime when it's snowing one day and you wanted to do some yard work, you can just go and hurry and sharpen and oil your tools, make sure that there's no rust on them, make sure that they're, they're clean and ready to go for when you can get outside and be taking care of stuff. Um, so making sure to take care of your tools and then when you're using them to make sure to wipe off dirt and grime or whatever you get on it when you're pruning and cutting back your stuff. Um, so next is pruning your trees and shrubs. Um, and this is just kind of gonna be a brief go over of pruning things. Uh, you want to make sure you're pruning them when they're dormant, right? So around this time is they're still dormant. Maybe buds are starting to kind of form. Um, but they're still pretty pretty dormant, so it's a good time to prune them back. Um, it's a little bit different with fruit trees. The pruning is gonna be a little bit more intense, um, but with other trees and shrubs, you're just pruning to remove dead or broken branches to improve the shape of the tree, to remove suckers, um, and branches that are rubbing together that'll cause future problems. Um, and then you wanna make sure you're using the correct pruning techniques, which is not taking more than a third of the tree away um, and not cutting into the tree collar. And then again, taking time to take care of those tools when you're pruning. So if you get sap on your tools and things, making sure to wipe that down. Um, or if you're cutting off something that looks like it had a disease, making sure to sanitize the blades afterwards. Um, early spring is a really good time to plant your cool season veggies, right? Um, and it's also a really good time to plan out your garden. So the rest of your garden, I mean, you can plant your early, early things and then plan on where you're going to be putting the next stuff. Um, you can kind of make your own little plan there. Um, and we have some examples of our early spring vegetables, some spinach, lettuce, carrots, peas. Those are some examples of your early ones. We want to wait to plant your other ones. So don't plant your squash, your corn, um, tomatoes. Those are things you're going to want to wait because they're really tender to the cold. Um, so wait on those other guys. Um, this is a time that you can start cutting back your leftover perennials if you didn't get them cut back in the fall. Um, and depending on the year, like this year has been really good because there was a few days where the snow all melted that I was able to get out and start working. Um, before it snowed again. So you can get working in the garden pretty early when you have those those days where there, it's sunny outside but it's not too hot. Um, and you can get out there and start raking and start cutting back and things. So I have some examples of how things look after they're cut down, some grasses and I mean they don't look awesome, they don't look great, but it looks a lot cleaner and then when things start greening up it's going to look really good. Um, and then weeding. This is something that you want to stay on top of, like from the get go. I, I feel like I've stayed on top of it from the get go and we still have so many weeds. I go out there and I walk around and there's more where I weeded the day before, right? So um, especially early, early spring, you're going to see weeds starting to come up. They've been watered by your snow melt. So um, the seeds that were there um, got their, their water. So they're starting. 
So you want to make sure that you're taking care of those. A drip irrigation will help you later to have less weeds because your drip will go straight to your plants instead of to the whole plant bed. Um, but at the very beginning, there's been moisture all over the place. So um, you're just gonna have to weed everywhere. That's just something in the spring that um, you're gonna have to be doing. You can use herbicides for your weeds, but you do wanna be careful. Um, springtime is a time for a lot of wind and herbicides can drift onto other plants that you don't want dying. Um, so just be really careful when you're spraying herbicides. Um, and then burning weeds is also an option, but you also wanna be careful with that as well that you're not catching other plants or yourself on fire. So doing that during kind of windy times probably isn't the best either. Um, so be really careful with both of those if that's something that you decide to do with weeding. All right, so mid spring, um, I would say mid spring is like about where we are now. Um, this is where you can start raking up your leaves because the snow is all melted. So raking up leaves and other debris. Um, other debris lately for me has been garbage that's been blown during our crazy wind storms. So <laughs> making sure to clean all that up out of your beds. Um, broken branches, any just kind of like little things that were left over from winter. Um, this is a good time to make some compost, cleaning up perennials and grasses. Still, if you're still working on that, that's totally fine. Again, weeding, checking and fixing irrigation. Around this time, irrigation is starting to come back on. You don't necessarily have to start irrigating everything like crazy because it is early spring, um, but it is a good time to turn on your zones and make sure things are working um, correctly. Starting up on your lawn, getting that stuff kind of going, um, and then planning and starting some of your projects that you have. So first, raking out your leaves and mixing in compost. Um, so your leaves and grass clippings can actually become compost over winter if it's mixed into your soil and nitrogen is added. So if you lay out your leaves and grass clippings in your beds and then put some nitrogen on there and then use your shovel to kind of turn the soil over um, to mix it in um, and then kind of adding air to the soil as well, it'll kind of just cook in that soil all winter long with the insulation of the snow. And then you'll kind of have this already made compost, um, which is really nice because it adds organic matter and nutrients into the soil. Um, if the leaves are just on top of the soil, when the snow is all melted and things, they most likely didn't break down enough. Um, so you'll want to remove those just because um, that's an ideal place for uh, mushrooms to start to grow with that like really moist kind of conditions. And then also when I was cleaning up the leaves in the garden this year, I was finding bulbs that had been trapped underneath the, the piles of leaves and they were all yellow because they were trying to grow, but there's not enough sunlight. <laughs> I felt so bad. So making sure to get those leaves out of there as soon as possible is um, a good thing to do. Um, and then when raking around your plants, this, your perennials are gonna be starting to kind of grow up. Your bulbs are gonna start to be showing or even blooming. Um, so you wanna be careful when you're raking around them and using these thin wire rakes are super good. I, I really like using these. This, this is what I use in, in the gardens. Um, it just helps it be a little bit more gentle around your plants. So cleaning up perennials, this is something you can continue to be doing. It's something that I've still continued to be doing. Um, um, some stuff is kind of hard to remove in the early summer or in the early, not summer, in the early spring, cause it's still too wet. So like, for example, day lilies, if they get really wet and they've been left over winter, um, the leaves become super duper soggy. So it's kind of hard to, to clean those guys up. So waiting until mid spring um, might be better with those if it's not dried out enough. Um, you wanna make sure that your tools are sharp with cutting back grasses, with, excuse me, cutting back day lilies and things because after winter those um, leaves and things have kind of just gotten really soft. So you want to make sure that your, your tools are sharp enough to be able to make it through them. Um, in cleaning up the grasses, you can cut them all the way to the ground pretty much. Um, you do want to be careful if they're already showing green. You don't want to cut into the new green growth. So that's something that you're going to kind of have to watch. So it's best to do grasses as soon as you can. 
um, and get those over with so that when they start growing, you're not worried about cutting into the new green growth. Um, there is a grass that's a little bit of, a, of an exception. It's the uh, Electrotricon sempervirens, blue oak grass. Um, these ones don't do super well with being cut back all the way to the ground. So it's best if you just use a rake to take the dead grass off. Um, and then using your hands to kind of pull it out. But make sure you wear gloves because I made the mistake of not wearing gloves and pulling and I ended up giving myself a humongous sliver. So wear gloves, um, but those dead stalks, they pull out pretty easily. So that's the best way to be able to do those guys. Um, so next is checking and fixing your irrigation. You wanna make sure you're looking for cut or damaged drip in your plant beds. Um, this can happen just with general cleanup, um, accidentally clipping it when you're cutting back grasses. I definitely did that a couple times in our garden this spring, so we're going to be fixing a lot of drip. Um, fixing your tilted spray heads in your turf areas. So for example, this example on this picture, um, that's really going to not be good for uniformity in your turf grass area. You do want to make sure that your heads are straight up and down. Um, no leaning or tilting. Um, and you want to make sure you're fixing your broken spray heads in your, in your turf areas as well. Anything that's kind of creating this geyser type of a thing. Um, and then again, weeding. Staying, stay on top of them. It's, they're going to be getting pretty, pretty happy right now, pretty big. So you want to make sure that you're staying on top of your weeds. Um, again, using herbicides and burning them. You just want to be really careful. Um, but it's something you can do or you can go with the other methods of hands and knees and, and tools, which I've been doing. Um, so either way works. Um, oh, and this is another, I must have switched the slides. Um, something else you want to do when you're fixing and checking your irrigation is, is cleaning out the filters, making sure those are all ready, um, reburying your drip lines. This is something that just kind of happens. Uh, your drip lines will start to to show through the mulch, through wind blowing the mulch, or just sometimes they just kind of move around in the winter and things. So um, making sure to rebury those just because the, the the material that they're made out of will get kind of brittle in the sun. So it's not good for them to be exposed to sunlight. Um, and then making sure that your water pressure for your things is is correct. Um, there should be pressure regulators on on things on the irrigation systems, but you just want to make sure that everything is good with that, just so that we don't have any um, kind of bad things happening with your pressure. And then, just as a reference, your drip irrigation pressure should, should be 10 to 30 psi, and then your spray is 30 to 50. We're all right. So next is starting up on your lawn, um, taking care of your tools to take care of your lawn. So that means, I don't know how many people actually do this, but like sharpening the blades on your lawnmower <laughs> um, is something that's actually really important. My parents just recently got a new lawnmower and I kind of want to be like, dad, you should stay up on that just because it does make a difference if the blades are taken care of. Um, so sharpening the blades on your lawnmower, making sure that it's clean. Um, and if you have, if you use like a, a hedge trimmer or uh, oh, Dave, I can't, I've, I've lost the word. The, the things that you like hold out and they have the, the, kind of the plastic things that like spin around. Your string trimmer or your edger. Yeah, yeah like an edger, <laughs> that type of thing, making sure that the, the string is new and that we're, you're, that, that's all ready to go too. So taking care of the tools to get ready for that, aerating your lawn, this is a really good time to do it. And then fertilizing, um, you can start up mowing. It, I mean, it, it's starting to green up right now just from the water from um, winter and things. So, and then again, checking and fixing the irrigation around it. Um, and then planning Had, and yes. Adrienne, can I add one quick thing on mowing? Yeah. It's a good time to, to maybe start mowing. However, being this year being really dry, if you if you haven't started watering and you haven't started doing a lot of that stuff yet, you're you're actually okay to wait. Don't worry about trying to cut it short. If you let it grow a little longer, the more foliage you have on top is photos photosynthesizing, 
it starts to develop a little deeper root system early, which will help you sustain maybe a more drought tolerant grass through the summer. So if you haven't started mowing, you know, don't, don't need to rush, don't let it get too tall, but don't, don't necessarily think, oh no, I got to get out there and start cutting that thing real short. It'll, it'll help you out be a little more drought tolerant through the summer. Great, yeah, that's a great point, Dave. Okay, oh, oh there we go. Um, I mean, this is also a really good time to be planning and maybe even starting some projects in your landscape. Um, things are still just kind of coming alive and, and you're, you might be like taking leaves out and things already may as well like maybe put in a pathway that you've been wanting to put in um because it's it's cooler temperatures outside and so it won't be like as strenuous of work to be doing it and things so this is a good time to be doing that or planning for projects that you're wanting to get done this is also a really good time for that before plants start coming into nurseries and things or things the the kind of nursery type of industry starts getting started, right? Um, and then just being careful around your bulbs um, because they will start sprouting up. And so you wanna make sure that when you're working in your beds that you're watching out for them because you can crush them and it's sad when you do <laughs> crush a tiny little bulb. Um, usually they'll be okay, but just kind of be careful. Um, and then watch them as they start growing and things and as the blooms start dying, um, you can snip off the blooms, but you want to make sure to leave the foliage just so they can get as much photosynthesis as they can. And then when the foliage starts to go brown, that's when you can cut them all the way back to the ground. So then late spring, um, this is like after frost is over. So um, like May, we, uh, we usually tell people after Mother's Day is usually when we're sick safe from the frost. Sometimes there's crazy things that happen, but that's usually what it is, is Mother's Day is like a pretty good time to plan on. If you really want to be careful, wait till after Memorial Day, because then you should be for sure okay by then. Um, but after we're not getting any more really cold nights, you can start planting things. Um, and then you're cutting back your bulbs as needed. And then also, again, weeding is something that's going to be pretty constant during the whole process. Um, so planting after the frost is over. Um, you can be planting trees, shrubs, perennials. Um, and here's some things to remember when you're planting that um, to remove the pot. So on if you buy a tree, you want to remove the pot or if the tree is bare root, removing the burlap, removing the wire, you want to make sure that you're removing all that stuff because it, they're not biodegradable and they will trap the roots. Um, we're trying to get those roots to spread into the, to the dirt, right? So we want to make sure to remove the pot. Um, as far as the hole for the plant, you want to make sure you're digging the hole as deep as the root ball is. Um, on trees, you want to make sure, I have a, a picture down there in the bottom right hand corner. You want to make sure that the hole is two to three times as wide as the diameter of the root ball. So if you have a 10 well, uh, okay, let's say you have a two foot diameter root ball, right? That means on each side of the root ball, both on like the right and the left, but also the front and the back, you need to have two feet um, of the hole dug. The hole doesn't need to be two to three times as, as deep. You want it to be as deep as, as it is with the, that the level of the soil that's already in there. Um, and making sure that you can see the trunk flare, which is that little spot. It's like a little area right before it roots. You don't want to have the soil above that. Um, so usually they do pretty good at keeping the soil level underneath that trunk flare, um, but you don't want to backfill too much. So making sure that the root ball is just, or that the, the depth of the hole is just as much as the root ball is um, but then making sure that it's um, two to three times as wide. And that's just to kind of disturb the soil around and kind of get it loosened up so that the roots can more easily get in there. Um, and then adding mulch over it. You don't want to have the mulch going right up to the trunk of the tree. You want to kind of create a well, um, but adding mulch to around 
the, the planting area will help with um, moisture and things. Um, and then it's a good idea to add fertilizer to new plants. Um, the little tablets that you see in the person's hand, we gave those with perennials and trees and shrubs when I worked at the, at the nursery last summer. Um, and it's just a little, it's a little thing of fertilizer that you can put like right next to the root ball when you plant it and it slowly re releases over the time that it's establishing, which is really nice. because it just gives it kind of that extra little boost that it needs when it's trying to establish in the ground. Um, and then making sure that when you plant something that you water it in, that's something that a lot of people forget about um, is the fact that it needs to be watered in when it's been planted. And then also that you will need to water your new plants more often than normal until they're established. So trees, it takes about a year and a half to establish. Um, perennials, I think it's about the same, maybe like a little less, but it's just enough to kind of get the roots to start growing. Um, your perennials, you'll pretty much know if they've established if they come back the next year after they've been planted. If they don't come back, I mean, they're dead, right? So not established. <laughs> um, but usually the trees, you'll need to be a little bit more careful with making sure um, the trees and shrubs that they're getting the amount of water needed for establishment. Um, but especially if you're planting in the springtime, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that they're getting a little bit more water than they normally would get, um, especially during those hot times in the summer. Um, and then also just cutting back bulbs as needed. So they have kind of started looking kind of ugly. There's some later bulbs that are still coming up and things, but you're gonna have a lot of flower heads that aren't looking good. So you can just clip off the flower heads, but again, leave that foliage until it starts looking brown, like the bottom picture there. Once it starts kind of looking like that, you can you can cut it back. It's it's getting a little bit too hot for it to be happy. So and it's got a lot of photosynthesis in it since it's been up and it'll put that energy down into the bulb so that it can go dormant and kind of start, well, it puts the energy down there so that it can make like a little, a little new bulb on the side. Um, but it also just helps it kind of get ready to make another flower the next year. Um, and then again, weeding, they will, they'll still be there. Um, so just making sure that you're staying on top of it um, again, using herbicides and burning weeds, just be really careful, especially kind of later into the season. It's getting a little bit hotter. You just want to really make sure that we're not blow torching a bunch of weeds in an area that's super dry and then we have a wildfire, right? So make sure that you're just being really, um, responsible when you're doing weed control. And that's all I have for the presentation. Um, Dave has been answering a lot of questions and things. Uh, I'm sure there are more questions to come about spring startup type of stuff. So let's see. Um, so we have a question. When tulips are lifted, do they need to be dried and stored at room temperature or refrigerated? Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, Dave, but I'm pretty sure you want you don't want them to be refrigerated. Um, and I think it's colder than room temperature, um, but you do they don't necessarily need to be dried. You don't want them to be sopping wet, but you do want them in a well ventilated area. You want them to be able to to breathe, but you don't want them to be you don't want it to be wet, but they don't necessarily you don't want it to be like dry and like turn in kind of like a crackly type of thing because that means that it's it's no longer alive, right? So you wanna make sure that it's still your nice little fleshy bulb, but um, you wanna store it in a dark place as well because you don't want it to start um, getting ready to go uh, again. So like, for example, my grandparents were keeping their I think it was, uh, I can't remember. It was some type of bulb that's really popular. Amaryllis, I think in Christmas. And they had it down in their storage room. So it was like, it was like cooler down there, like good temperature, um, but like well ventilated and everything. 
but the problem was is that they would go down there quite often and turn on the light um, and there was light that seeped under the door so the bulb actually started growing um, and so it, it thought that it was time to grow so it, um, it looked really sad it was all white and it didn't produce a flower but so just making sure that it's in a really dark place that doesn't get light um, and slightly colder than room temperature I would say hope that helps let's see yeah one other thing to add there's you, yeah I've done two you can do actually two things if you don't want to store the bulbs but they need to be moved or divided you can actually dig them up and then immediately plant them again but if you intend to store them then they do you don't want it like Hattie Ann said you don't want to dry them out completely but essentially they're drying out and so that it's like an onion. You kind of get the outer edge, you'll get that little bit of dried skin, but the inside is still nice and healthy and, and green. And so you, you do keep the temperatures moderate. A lot of times people store them in kind of sawdust where it's not moist, but not dry. And storing them can be a challenge. If you throw them in your hot garage all summer, by the time you're ready to plant in the fall, they'll be dead. They'll be dried up completely. Yeah, great. Thanks, Dave. Um, and yeah, like Dave said, you want to make sure that they're in a well ventilated area. In my last job, we had, well, at the moment, I didn't know what it was. There was these nasty bags in like one corner of this area. And I was like, what are those? And the one day I saw fruit flies all over them. And I was just like, those are going out right now. And they were bulbs that they had like stored from the year before but no one had taken care of them and they were not well ventilated and it was so nasty. So make sure that they're well ventilated because <laughs> even if they do okay, if they're not in a good ventilated area and they're too moist and they're all packed together in a plastic sack, they will rot and it smelled so bad. Um, yeah, so hopefully that helped you. Uh, let's see, next question. Do you wait for the stems and leaves to dry before cutting them back? Um, I'm guessing you're talking about perennials. I think they're, I think they're talking about bulbs. There's another for one bulbs. of those as well for da tulips and daffodils. Oh, okay. I think is what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, not necessarily like, I mean like the stem of the, of the flower, I haven't necessarily been cutting it back all the way to the ground. I mostly just kind of been pruning the, the flower head off. Um, but as far as like the leaves, I'd wait until they're kind of not looking super good because you do want to like keep them up as long as possible. Um, but I mean, you don't you don't want them to be like an eyesore for your for your garden, right? So if you if you're seeing them and you're like those are looking really ugly and they're kind of yellowish and they look like they're going downhill, take them out. Um, I mean, they've had a whole springtime to kind of photosynthesize and things. Uh, and if you never if you never get time to get to those though and they do dry out completely it's not a big deal they can dry yeah. out it's just the aesthetic appeal you, you know to have these dead tulip tops or leaves and daffodil leaves that are all dried up and crispy so yeah once they start turning yellow like Hetty and said you can take them out leave them green as long as possible though because that's photosynthesizing and storing energy for the next year's bloom yeah exactly uh next one are there any water retention products that you recommend for containing rainwater? Um, not any that, that I know of. Do you know of any, Dave? You know, the only thing I can think of with, with that is there are landscape polymer products. Honestly, it's, let me describe it this way. It's the same products used in a diaper, but it, it's, it's a polymer, so it absorbs water. And so, I mean, it's not the exact diaper polymer, but it's the same concept as you have these little pellets and when water hits, they absorb water. And then as water is gone in the soil, they can release water back to the soil. I've never really seen those used on a broad scale in your whole landscape. Most of the time those are used in containers to help retain moisture in hanging pots and baskets and those kind of things, because they do help retain water in those pots. Um, to do it, something like that over your entire landscape probably isn't practical. And maybe, I don't know, I've never heard of it done or seen it done here. Uh, but there are those, there are landscape products like that, that that will help retain water in the soil. If you're talking about retention products like 
rain barrels and stuff like that, then certainly there are rain barrels and you know, catch containers from downspouts and stuff like that. Aline, if that doesn't answer your question, please type a follow-up. Thanks, Dave. Um, next one is from Heather. She says, I have two newer trees that were planted within the last two years. I'd like to relocate them uh, where they're, I'd like to relocate where they are to another spot. Should I move them in the spring or fall or does it matter? Um, so, I mean, I don't think it matters. If, I, I would hope that they're not super huge. I mean, if they're planted within the last two years, they're probably okay. Um, you just, I mean, main things I would say is just making sure that you make that root ball big enough. You don't want to be like chopping off roots as close to the tree as you can, right? So making sure to make a pretty good sized root ball um, and then just being really careful in the transport. You don't really want to be like being super duper rough with it. I mean, you don't have to baby it, but you don't want to just be like ripping out <laughs> roots and things. Um, but then you will have to treat it as if it were a brand new tree from a nursery. So it's going to have to reestablish. Um, but both in the spring or fall, I think is 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 good for for either of those, right, Dave? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's correct. Ideally, just think of it this way: you you want to do it when the plant has the least potential for great stress. Fall is cooler, spring is cooler, so there's less stress, you know. And ideally, if the tree hasn't really started leafing out, now is a great time. It's still dormant, so there's not a lot of stress. It's not transpiring a lot from the foliage, you know, that kind of stuff. So if you get a lot of roots, digging it up and moving it right now, and kind of watch it as the temperatures warm, you know, keeping it keeping it moist while you establish it, you'd have very good success transplanting it now in the spring. You think of bare root trees that are sold in the nursery, you know, they come with no soil on them right now, they're dormant, you put them in the ground and they grow. So it's the kind of the same concept with transplanting in the sp early spring. But if you, if you don't have time to do it now or, or whatever, you still have lots of time this spring or wait until temperatures drop in September and then deal with it then. Sweet, that's what I was thinking. All right, next one. Um, uh, mitten gladioles are so invasive. Um, I would sink a pot and plant them in that so the plants have borders. Um, so as far as like, so I think if you, I, I don't, I'm not sure if this is what you're meaning, but sink a pot meaning like kind of planting a pot in the ground. So it's kind of creating a border. Um, I mean, that could work maybe but the problem is is that like especially mint it's extremely easy for it to kind of go where it wants to so even if you have a border around it it'll find its way um i think the easiest thing to do with anything that's pretty invasive that you're worried about getting in other places um in your plant bed or other areas in your yard um is to put it in a container that's not not in the ground like that's separate from everything else just to like make sure because i mean mint is really awesome and it's a great plant to have great herb right um but it does spread very easily so having it it's it, mint does extremely well in containers so having it in a container maybe next to your porch or something um is a great place to be able to put it uh, do you have anything else on that dave i i've done both where I put them in containers on a patio and it worked like Hattie Ann said, that's a great in a, in a container. If you're gonna put a pot in the ground, do what they call pot in pot. So put a pot in the ground and then have your mint in a pot and then put it in that pot. So it's kind of double pots. <laughs> um, and they do this, Utah State does this for tree, for plant research at the Greenville Farm in Logan all the time. And they do pot in pot planting. And the idea is though that the reason you do that is simply to keep the roots in a in a ground level condition where the temperatures are cooler on the roots, so you don't have to water them nearly as much. Um, but again, if a pot with a drainage in the bottom, those roots will go out of that drainage and easily spread into the bed that they're planted in. So double potting that helps. But you, uh, Hattie Ann's correct; they can still spread. So you'd have to just really stay on top of it. And if you see it spreading, immediately dig up any little starts, any little things that are growing if you don't want it to take off. All right. All right. Thank you. Next. 
Um, do you cut back lavender? Is it the same for month and hit coat? Yes. So you don't cut it back all the way to the ground. Lavender is one of those, um, they're a little bit unique. Um, so on a lavender plant, you have like the foliage, right? So that kind of bluish green foliage. And then you have that little flower stem. And you can cut back the flower stems to the leaves. That's that's going to be your best thing. So the leaves on, on the lavender are um, evergreen. So they're ones that you, you don't want to cut into those leaves. Um, so you just cut back the flowers. It can be kind of tricky. It's okay if you like cut a little bit into the leaves, right? It's going to be all right if you do. But you just want to cut back the flower heads. So yes, um, you do cut back lavender, but only only the flower heads and the little stems. So back to the to where the leaves start with lavender. Okay. Um, we have a question about the laws and regulations covering uh, using rainwater. I think that there are some. I'm not sure what they are. Dave, do you know yeah. a little bit more about those? Yes, there are state laws governing how much water you can collect from runoff on your property. And current current law it used to be less. They've raised that statewide. You can you can collect 2,500 gallons. In, in other words, not at a single time, but you can have the capacity to collect and store 2,500 gallons of rainwater. Um, runoff is actually considered water of the state because it eventually makes its way into a waterway, either a stream, a river, or a lake, a canal, somewhere. Storm even storm water eventually ends up in a waterway that's governed by the state um, Corps of Engineers. So yes, um, certainly be, be aware, you can't just dig yourself a giant hole and, and you know get some tank that holds 10,000 gallons. That would be against the law and somebody might come after you. <laughs> um, but typically if you've got 50 gallon rain barrels on each of your downspouts on your house or something like that, you're not gonna come close to the 2,500 gallons. Uh, but that is what the current state law is on rainwater and rainwater water harvesting. Great, thanks. Um, when is the best time to treat for grubs? This is a good question. Um, I don't know the specific answer to it, Dave. I'm not yeah. super familiar with grubs. So grubs, to help everybody with this, because this is a this is a question that comes up every single year, and every and a lot of people struggle with grubs. There are different, first of all, there's different kinds of grubs and think of a grub, a grub is simply a part of a life cycle of a type of bug. So it's either going to be the larva of a beetle or the larva of a moth. And so depending on the time of year and the time of, and the type of bug, that's the type of grub you may be dealing with in your lawn. And most, most grubs would be, eating the crowns and the roots of the of the plants that so the bug the, the beetle or the moth has laid eggs the egg hatches goes down into the ground it's in its larval stage eating the roots growing and then as soon as that larva is big enough it pupates and becomes the adult bug again and is no longer eating the roots so grubs are very very specific on timing it most of the time it's like a three-week window of when that egg has hatched, when it's in a larva stage and become, be, before it becomes the adult bug. And so Utah State has some great resources on, on bugs, the different types of grubs, but typically your typical time frame for most grubs is as temperatures warm up a little bit, you're kind of right mid-June into July is kind of your typical window. Now that can shift a little bit based on temperatures and some other factors. But if you, if you really want to get a handle on it for where you live, go to the USU Extension IPM. It's the Integrated Pest Management website. So if you do a little search for USU IPM, you can find a lot of good information on the specific timing and, and different treatments for the different grubs that might be affecting your lawn. I hope that answers that. Sweet. Thanks, Dave. Okay, next question. <clears throat> Um, this person has a tree that sends up hundreds of suckers repeatedly all season long. <laughs> Any advice for minimizing or stopping this? Um, <laughs> so 
The problem with that is it's just probably the type of tree that you have. Um, I mean, for example, aspens are one of those that do it very frequently and very, um, there are like a ton of, of suckers and things. So it just kind of depends on the tree that you, that you have. Um, there's not really a lot that you can do for minimizing or stopping it because it's just the habit of the tree that it's doing it. Um, and especially trees that that's how they propagate and things like this, just going to keep doing it. Um, so I don't know, do you have any other tips, Dave? Because as far as I know, I don't think that there's much that you can do for trees that, sh that shoot them out that fast. <laughs> Yeah, there's really not because you can't spray them. That'll draw it down and kill the whole tree. It, it is a type of tree problem. And some trees are like that. They just want to sucker. Uh, I, I, if you, I don't know, you could tell us what kind of tree it is, but it's really not going to matter if, if you, any of you have a tree that just suckers a lot, or even if you have a tree that doesn't sucker a lot, but it suckers a lot right at the base, just from the crown and the, the roots right by the base of the tree, there's not much you can do with that other than just keep cutting the suckers down. Um, a lot of newer trees are grafted onto a different kind of rootstock. Sometimes that rootstock gets aggressive and it just wants to grow. And so it shoots up those extra suckers. Um, if it's older trees like aspens and some of those that just tend to sucker and that's how they grow you know, more of themselves. They, they sucker another one over here and it grows into a mature tree and they just keep doing that. And from one giant mass of tree, um, you just can't do anything about it other than keep cutting them off or mowing them off if they're in your lawn. But then eventually you do end up with those, you know, lumpy root nodules and all those kind of things. So you can get rid of the tree and plant something else. That's the only way you're really going to eliminate it altogether. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> My parents, they have aspens and we, uh, the one, I mean, we've been cutting off those suckers all like ever since we've had them, it's been 20 plus years. And we, in the lawn area, we just have these massive little like hardened, I feel like hard as a rock all over in the grass. It's like ruined the entire lawn area. <laughs> so yeah, sorry, that's not probably the answer that you wanted, but <laughs> it's just kind of how those trees work. <clears throat> Next question. What's the best way to keep deer from munching on small new trees? Great question. Um, and, and not only do deers sometimes munch on smaller new trees, but they also can reach their antlers around and rub the fur off their antlers and kill the tree that way as well. Um, so best way to do it is putting um, some type of protector around the trunk of the tree so that the antlers can't get in there. Or if they're eating like the, the leaves and things, you're gonna wanna like wrap them or put a fence or not a fence, like a type of mesh or something around them. Just like anything to keep the deer from either nipping at it or rubbing their antlers on it. Um, that's kind of the protection that you're gonna wanna, wanna do. So just kind of adding that protection to them is gonna be the best way to keep them. There is also like some deer repellent type of stuff. Um, we did a deer resistant landscaping class a couple weeks ago um, and I talked about some of the deer repellents on there. Um, USU Extension has a, a whole page about like deer resistant landscaping and some and some tips and tricks that you can use to try to keep them from eating or like ruining your plant beds and things. So definitely go look at that. Um, and then because they have they have on there also like a homemade deer repellent that you can make, but you also can get deer repellents from nurseries. It's like deer gone or deer, deer off or something like that. I can't remember the, the full name, but it's, but it has uh, just kind of stuff in it that the, that the deers don't like the smell of it. So they tend to stay away. Um, yes, yeah, so I hope that helped with that question. I'll, um, just, next. I'll just throw out some sort of comical yeah. joke. Get yourself a crossbow. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. If you like deer, if you like venison jerky, maybe no, don't go poaching any deer. But that's what you want to do. I know that's what you want to do because that's what I wanted to do. 
Okay. I mean, you could get a license and then get a crossbow. <laughs> yeah, don't don't poach one. It's not worth going to jail and having a big fine for that. It's way more expensive than buying a new tree. <laughs> Alrighty, um, next question. Can I divide hostas now as they are coming up? Um, I'm not sure on that. Dave, I've never divided hostas myself. I don't know how well they divide. You know, they, they can be divided. I think you're probably best, maybe wait for them to come up a little bit um, and, then, and then divide them. <clears throat> um, I, I honestly don't have, I don't have any hostas in my yard. I like hostas and they're, they're beautiful and they can be good in dry shade and all that stuff. Um, most of the time, any experience that I've talked to people about hostas, a lot of people do it in the fall is when they divide them. You're, you're, it's easy to see everything and it's all completely up. And you can just dig it up, divide things apart and, and then replant them. And then they tend to do really well, but you could probably divide them in the spring I, I don't really know a good answer for that because I don't grow them myself. I should. <laughs> then I would know the answer. <laughs> right. Well, and I've, I've never had any experience with dividing them either. So I'm like, I'm not sure. But I would I would probably um, agree with you to wait until they're a little bit bigger just because, I mean, it goes kind of with the same thing as transplanting a new tree, right? So you want to transplant it when it's getting the least amount of stress. So with a new hosta, it's trying to like get its leaves and stuff out there. It's putting that energy into that. It doesn't really want to put its energy into getting new roots right now. So maybe waiting until they're a little bit bigger and the, and the leaves have come out and it started to photosynthesize and things and then um, transplanting it and, and dividing it and things probably be best. Okay, next question. Um, I would like to convert part of my lawn to an area for other shrubs and plants. Um, do I need to kill the grass or can I just dig it up? What's the correct method for accomplishing this? Um, yes, so you will, I mean, it is best to kill the grass. You can dig it up, but the problem with that is that if you leave any roots, you'll end up with grass in your in your plant bed. So it is best to, to kill it all the way off. Um, I mean, the, the correct method, as kind of personal preference because I would say like take some roundup to the grass and just make sure it's dead but some people don't like using chemicals so they do other methods such as um, kind of like the greenhouse effect where you kind of suffocate it to death or putting cardboard and things over it, making sure that it doesn't get any sunlight or water so that it just kind of dies off um, but you want to make sure that it's all the way dead and then you, you can either take a tiller and kind of till it into the dirt, or you can dig it up after you're, you're sure that it's all the way um, all the way dead. And then you should be good. Um, do you have anything else to add, Dave, on that one? Um, no, you, you've, you've covered it. You can dig it up. It, you, if you attempt to dig grass out, though, you've got to realize, depending on the kind of grass that's there, you can still leave a few rhizomes in the ground and then they'll inevitably come back up and it'll yeah. be really difficult to deal with once you have other broadleaf plants. So I think Hattie Ann's recommendation, if you're not, if you're not opposed to using an, an herbicide or, you know, Roundup, anything with glyphosate, it'll kill the grass. And then usually th this time of year, the energy from the roots is kind of going up. They're pu it's pushing new growth. So you may spray it and it'll, it'll look like it's dead. I would recommend spraying it, wait a couple weeks, even letting water still happen. If, if you've started watering or you can put a little water on it. Funny enough, people say, well, why would you do that? Because you want to know if anything's still actively growing, it's going to grow up and then you spray it again. And then you make sure that it's dead that way, spraying a couple times. And then usually it's dead. I, I don't even worry about digging it out once it's dead. Usually that the top vegetative stuff, it's it's dry and brown. You can scrape that off, but you don't need to necessarily dig everything out once that grass is dead. It's just organic matter in the soil. Right, right. Sweet. Thanks, Dave. Um, so it looks like we've gone through all the questions. If anybody else has any more, if you just want to put them in that Q&A box. Meanwhile, we're waiting for just any more questions. Mm -hmm. you know, 
had he uncovered some irrigation stuff really briefly. And we are going to do an irrigation workshop this mm -hmm. coming Saturday. So if you've got a lot of, if you've got irrigation questions or you're struggling and you're trying to figure out maybe how to, how to go about irrigating this summer, or even there were a couple of questions about changing parts of your yard and knowing how to, how to change something around or the different products. This irrigation workshop intent is to, to focus on, you know, how, not only just the parts, so you understand the parts and pieces a little bit better, but then how do you set it up? I'll, I'll go into scheduling just a little bit because, but because there's so many factors to scheduling irrigation. I won't, I won't leave you with a schedule per se, but we'll talk a little bit about some of those factors. And if hopefully this year being that it's dry, we want to just help people understand Yes, you have investment in the landscape. Yes, you're doing all these things, but you can still reduce water. You can still be very effective with water, stretch those water resources and, and still have everything look good. And that's the intent. So uh, join us Saturday morning if you're interested in that irrigation class, because we'll, we'll go into a lot of depth with that. Sweet. Yeah, it should be it should be a good one, and I think it'll be really good for all the, those who have a lot of questions about irrigation and the different types and things. So it should be really good. So Pamela, Pamela asked if it, the Saturday class is entire lawns or just garden watering. It's it's going to cover a little of everything. So we're going to cover all of the types of different sprinklers for gear driven heads, pop up fixed spray heads, you know the impact heads, and then into drip irrigation for or flower beds, shrub beds, trees, vegetable gardens, raised beds. So it'll kind of focus on the products and then how that product can be applied to different watering situations. So whether it's lawn or gardens, you know, beds or whatever, we'll talk about the products that help you become efficient with maximizing the resource where you are. And soils play a big part of that too. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about soils there, but I mean, we won't, it's not a soils class, but that is a factor in irrigation always. Sweet. Um, next, can I put preen or other pre-emergence down now? Yes. Yeah, it's actually, so I don't, depending on where you live, um, we are forecasted to possibly get rain. It is a really good, good idea to put down pre-emergence before it rains, because that kind of helps it to start kind of getting into the soil and, and getting that pre-emergent going. So yes, you do want, you can, you can put it down now. Just make sure that it's not on a day that's like super windy or, um, well, yeah, I guess just, if it, just make sure it's not super windy because then it blows all away. I had that happen the other day. So um, yes, you can put those down now. Yeah, one thing with any pre-emergence, Preen is a brand, it's a pre-emergence, so you can apply any pre-emergent right now. Yeah. The idea is just get it, get it watered in. And then if you're doing it in flower beds, if you disturb the soil, you've ruined the effect of the pre-emergent. Pre-emergent puts a thin layer of chemical in the ground. So you, you would apply it after you've done your weeding, after you've done whatever cultivating or mixing in mulch, whatever you're doing, then apply the pre-emergent and leave it alone because it'll create a very thin layer. So any seeds that do germinate hit that little chemical layer and it kills the seed, the, the little seedling before you see it. Uh, but so don't, if you disturb it, then you've ruined that chemical layer and you will still get weeds and you've essentially just wasted your money on pre-emergent that's not doing any good. Right, right. Um, perfect. Um, and we have one more question. I was typing an answer, but it might be good for everyone else to hear as well. Um, she's asking if we need to register for, for the, the irrigation class and when and where. So yes, uh, register for the class. It is Zoom, so you will, you'll need to register to be able to get the code. Um, it's on our website, theweaverbasin.com. Same place where you registered for this class, and then it's happening this Saturday, so get registered as soon as possible. Um, but yeah, if you just go to weaverbasin.com, underneath classes and events, you can register for it there. And you'll get a link just like you did for this class, a Zoom link, yeah. and you'll just sign in the exact same way. And uh, it'll uh, it'll be a little different because there will be some slides, but I intended showing you the best I can through a camera 
you know, these products and talking about them. So it, it'll hopefully be a little more engaging, but there will definitely be some slides and everything else that we've been doing virtually the best we can.